I had this small tube in front of me. There's nothing in the tube. It's a clear liquid and you add the alcohol and this DNA appears by magic. And it's such an incredible moment because you look at it and you think, oh my gosh, I've got the instructions to make a mosquito right there. My guest this week is Dr. Mandy Hartley. Mandy is a geneticist, children's author, and a science advisor. She has a degree in pathobiology from Reading University and a PhD in genetics from Aberdeen University. As a genetist, as a geneticist, Mandy has worked to preserve sea life in the North Sea, worked with the NHS to help people with various illnesses, helped set up forensic laboratories with the Norfolk Police, and has also helped identify long-lost family members. Currently, Mandy runs The Little Storytelling Company. She is the author of the DNA Detective series of books for children, and is currently working to try and set up a science centre in Norfolk. Mandy, welcome to STEM with Mr N. Oh, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. So to start off, first, can you just tell us what is a geneticist? Yeah, it's quite a tricky word, isn't it? Well, um, genetics covers lots of things, but really it's, it's kind of learning and studying about DNA and how we inherit things and how that might affect us. So um, you mentioned there that I used DNA to help sea life. So in that context, um, we were looking at genetics to kind of help find out um, different stocks of fish in the North Sea. And, and use their DNA to try and identify them really, to try and label them. So we could work out where these stocks were and stop them being overfished um, and help them to sustain themselves really. So in that, in that form, it's DNA um, relating to fish, but it's DNA obviously is found in all living things. So again, genetics relates very much to humans. So studying disease, how we might inherit diseases from our DNA, um, uh, and, and kind of using that to help people. So genetics really encompasses lots, lots and lots of things, but it really is about our DNA, um, about our instructions and the instructions for life and how we can use those to help people and understand more about our, our planet and how we survive and thrive. So as you mentioned there, obviously all living things have DNA. Does that mean there's quite a broad spectrum of things that you can do as a geneticist rather than specialising in one area? Absolutely. And that was one of the things that really drew me into the um, to working in that field. It's so, so huge. You can work in a laboratory. You could work if you like computers. There is so much data being amassed at the moment through um, studying DNA and genetics of things. So if you like computers, it's a brilliant subject to go into as well. Again, English and maths, they're, they're all combined, all the different subjects are combined in this, this huge field. So yes, it's, and it, it's so, so varied. The careers are amazing. If you get bored of doing one thing, you can then change to another like I did. You know, you can, you can start maybe um, helping conserve animals using DNA. Then I wanted to work on people, I wanted to help people. So you can help people with genetic diseases, find out what's wrong with them, hopefully make them better. Um, and then I, I helped the Norfolk Police set up the forensic laboratories, you know, to try and catch these criminals. And then DNA bringing families together. And one thing I didn't do, and I wish I did, is using DNA to help archeologists answer questions about the past. It is such a varied career and so wonderful um, to work on. You know, it's, it's brilliant. And now you've taken your career to the point that you're doing the Little Storytelling Company. So can you tell us all about, about what the Little Storytelling Company is and what you do? Well, I'm um, a mum, as much as anything, of, of two children. And I know sometimes how, um, sometimes it's not always, you know, it's difficult to make science exciting for children. And some topics are really, really complicated. It's difficult to understand those. So my idea was using stories to explain these difficult concepts to children. So um, I go into school and topics like evolution inheritance, uh, I, go in, I go along with my ultimate alien story and we blast off to a planet and all these different aliens have different colored um, hair, uh, different kinds of hair. Some, some have straight hair, some have long hair, or they have these, um, these, these funny noses. So some have short noses and some have long noses. And then we see how some of the aliens thrive in certain situations 
and some of them are killed off and we can see the effects of natural selection. So, um, so things like uh, the, there are craters on this planet full of popcorn and the aliens with the long noses can reach their noses to get the popcorn right at the bottom of these craters. So when food becomes short, these aliens thrive and survive, um, whereas the ones with the short noses, they die. And we have, a, we have a very dramatic routine for the aliens dying where their eyes fall out, which the children love. But it's using stories like these. The children don't even know they're learning. And yet at the end of it, they can tell you what evolution is, what natural selection is, what inheritance is. And that really is the, the aim of, of the little storytelling company is to make, make science A, hands-on, interactive, fun, and to explain these difficult concepts, but to make them memorable, you know, um, and, and for me, going into schools, teaching these fantastic workshops is the best thing in the world. When you see a child's eyes light up because they've got it and they understand it, well, that's magic, isn't it? And that's, that's, why, that's why people love being teachers, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And that's why I love using stories in the classroom that use STEM and have STEM involved in the stories because as you said it's an easy way to get into the, the concept and a story when you're invested in these characters so is that what then led to you writing the dna detective series yeah well i think it, it's the uh, it's the characters but also children like solving problems and if you can relate the science that they're learning about and make sense of it to real life situations then they're hooked they're like oh i want to solve that oh so i see why we're learning about that now um, I, I see how scientists are using that. Oh my gosh, what we've just learned about. Oh, that's what the, those scientists are doing in real life. Um, and, and, and that was part of the book was to combine this science and, and literacy um, to get children learning and, and having fun and get lost in the story. You know, how brilliant to get kids excited about science, but get them reading as well and desperately wanting to read the next chapter. I mean, that's that's just magical. Um, and for me, I do these workshops. I kind of uh, I, I live in Norfolk, so I, I can reach kind of Suffolk, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire. Um, I, I have gone as far as Cheltenham to the Science Festival and up to London. But really, imagine if I could reach kids all around the world. You know, imagine if I could get kids excited, you know, as far away as China and Japan and America and Iceland. And, and that's where my book's gone. And all these kids. Are like well, I want to want to work with DNA, want to be a geneticist. I mean, how magical is that, you know? And I, what I didn't understand when I wrote the books is the feedback that I would get and how incredible that is. I mean, it really is like the cherry on the top of the cake, you know. These kids who never wanted to read before, you know, absolutely loving this. And um, there's a school that I've I've done a lot of work with in um, in London, and these children didn't really read at home um you know uh, it wasn't something they did as a family uh, but there's a lady there and she she has this group and they read and these children their their reading age was really low but they loved the books so 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 much um, and their aspirations career-wise you know went from you know and there's nothing wrong with this at all but working in a shop or you know something like that to actually they wanted to be detectives they wanted to be forensic scientists um, and, and they were so keen to come into that group and read the next chapter. Um, and it was just amazing. And then I, I did a Q&A with these kids and that you could see their love for science was just kind of bubbling over. Um, and, and yeah, what, what a magical thing, you know, to be part of. It's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> that's a great story to show the power of storytelling. Um, so right now there's three books in the DNA Detective series. There's To there Catch is. a Thief. Uh, the Stone Age Mystery yes. and The Smuggler's Daughter. Would you be able to give us a brief overview of the... I see you've got the three books there, and I've got the <laughs> me too. Would you be able to give yes. us a brief overview of these three books, you know, roughly what the yes. story is about? Yes, I would love to. Well, these books, um, you know, not only wanting to spread the message of science and get kids excited, but I'm a mum and I want to remember the funny things that my kids do. So the characters are based on my children. So uh, this is Annabelle, she's now 14, but when I started writing them, she was much younger. Um, and this is Harry, my son. And the beautiful thing about the characters is that um, Annabelle is, she's the kindest person you'll ever meet. She is super cautious about things. She's very, very careful and um, she's super clever as well. And Harry is the polar opposite. So he is mental and he will injure himself just from walking through a door. Loves PS4, loves football. So those two characters, children can immediately relate to. And it's also about our dog Millie and so many of the kids have dogs, they, they love that. So in this first adventure, 
um, their pet dog Millie is stolen and Annabelle and Harry set out to collect clues and become forensic scientists, a bit like a modern day Enid Blyton. So if Enid Blyton could have forensic scientists, she would, she'd have DNA in her stories. So um, they set out to catch the clues. They have a, they, they build up a, a kind of suite of suspects and they use the DNA evidence to work out who it is. Um, and they also, so in the story, I'm obviously the mum, I have my own laboratory um, working on various DNA projects. So they break into my lab and use my lab to extract DNA. So that is a fantastic one. So yes, yeah, so they catch, uh, they have to try and catch the thief who's stolen Millie. In the second one, it's kind of, um, so this is the DNA detectives, the smuggler's daughter. So it's based on my childhood holidays in Cornwall, which I spent looking for smugglers because I was convinced that I would be the one that would find that tunnel that the smugglers had obviously worked very hard to cover up, but I would find it and I would find the treasure. And that's all I did if I was on the beach was look for these tunnels. So this in a way is a, a kind of dream come true for me, this book, because we find the treasure. So it starts with um, Harry and Annabelle go rock pooling on holiday and they find a locket in a rock pool. As the sun shines, it catches uh, the, the, the um, locket catches the sun and there's a glint and they see it and when they open it up there's a picture of a girl and a lock of hair and that is the start of the adventure can they return the treasure to its rightful owner so there's lots and lots of twists and turns in that one it's a really really exciting one and um it's it's my favorite i think that one so far so far um and then the third one uh which is the dna detectives the stone age of mystery so this one, I wanted to really combine literacy, science and history. Um, I thought it would be a fantastic thing for teachers teaching this subject. It, it's just, you know, would make their life so much easier. So um, the story starts, they, they go to school and they hear this, uh, they're changing their library books and they hear this crash. And when they rush into the school hall, it's collapsed. And they climb down inside the, the hole and they basically find this cave and it's full of cave paintings um and there's an ancient grave but they discover that somebody's been there and somebody is stealing the artifacts for the grave so the the story is about trying to get the find out who's stealing the artifacts but also interwoven into the plot is how scientists and archaeologists can answer questions about the past so how we can use dna from the skull there's a the tiny bone in the skull called petrus bone um, and it is a fantastic source of DNA because it's so dense. There's loads of cells there. You can get lots of DNA. So it's it's real life science. And it's even how scientists have got DNA from tartar on teeth. It's kind of like a living fossil in your mouth. Um, and and they, they found things like, uh, you know, the, um, the hemp that they used to sew their clothes with. They found paint from the cave paintings and they can use DNA to find out what they ate, what diseases they had, even what they looked like. But in the book, then you can relate it back to things like Cheddar Man, so real life science. So all the way through the books for each chapter, there's web links where the kids can do fun activities, find out more about science in the book. So it's a very, yeah, it's an exciting one, that one. And I think the uh, the end to it is a real twist. It's really, really cool and based actually um, on, on a real forensic case, which I don't know if I want to give too much away, but... No, hang on to the spoilers. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hold on to that one, but it's, there's a, a brilliant twist that is based on this amazing forensic case that happened in real life. I think it was in Denmark. Um, so that that's brilliant. And um, I was just saying to Stuart that just before I came on, I, I'm, I'm on to chapter two of the fourth book, which is very exciting. So I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be called The DNA Detectives, The Riddle of the Viking Treasure. And um, it starts during lockdown. So it combines uh, Vikings, COVID. In fact, COVID and the track and trace is, is helps with how they, they catch the thief. And it's also about forensic ecology. So it links in really well with rocks and soils and life cycles. Um, and yeah, it starts off, so they're, uh, they're out on their kayak. They've managed to escape lockdown a little bit. They're out on their kayak. Millie sees a swan, the boat falls over and Harry swims to the side and he finds this bag. And inside the bag is this Viking sword and it, and it kind of starts from there. So it's, uh, yeah, it's exciting. And that actually makes a really good link back. Now, this is quite funny because you've obviously got no idea that I've done this interview. But one of the interviews that's come out just before this one is with a bioarchaeologist who specialises in Vikings. 
Uh, oh my goodness! So it, it's great that in the smuggler's daughter, you were talking about that bioarchaeology and getting DNA yeah, from the yeah. bones, and now you're on to the Vikings. And one of the things that came up in that interview was actually that a lot of finds do come from amateur archaeologists. So it's great that even that's worked its way into your new book with the children making this yeah. discovery. Well, it's it's no, it, it's such a weird thing. So I've just started writing the book. And last Saturday, um, an exhibition opened at the local museum about Viking finds that were found in the local area, including um, Thor's hammer, this beautiful gold hammer that was found literally in the next village along from us. So I'm, 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 that's where I'm heading. <laughs> I could sit and speak about the books all day, but I want to actually go <laughs> back the way into your past and find out what first got you interested in STEM? Uh, well, I think it's funny, isn't it? Because a lot of children at school, they don't know what they want to do. If you ask them, they have no idea whatsoever. Um, but for me, it was always science, always, always science, always had that interest, never had to question what else was there. Um, you know, possibly because my, my dad's a chemistry teacher. Um, you know, my mum's a primary school teacher, but her specialism was science. So, um, yeah, just interest me. I want to know how things work and, you know, particularly biology. I was really interested in how the body works and you know and the, the kind of the minute detail it's just yeah always science for me so why did you particularly aim for genetics as you were going through your science journey ah uh, well it's interesting well you see when i went to university dna really um you know it was a while ago and it's not to say that it was in its you know it, it was past its very early stages but you know it's it still quite a new thing and it's quite interesting that the the DNA that we learn in our degree, children that like that would have taken a whole term. Children at secondary school now learn in in you know a couple of weeks. It's quite phenomenal um, how much it's changed. But I I did a project as part of uh, my degree on DNA. So it was on a mosquito called Culex pipiens kinkipasiatus, and we were trying to find out why mosquitoes were resistant to pesticides and insecticides to kind of stop them spreading malaria. So we had to sequence a bit of DNA. Um, so if you imagine the letters of the alphabet, there's 26 in the alphabet. In DNA, there's just four, A, C, G, and T. So at that stage in technology, we could only confidently sequence 400 A, C's, G's, and T's, and that took us a week. So now, um, in places like the Sanger Center, and I guess all around the world, they can sequence the whole human genome, all 3.5 billion base pairs of it in 45 minutes, which just blows my mind. But anyway, I was on this project, I was in the lab, uh, not, not sure what colour my hair was at that stage, <laughs> being a student, I was looking pretty cool, but I had this small tube in front of me. There's nothing in the tube, it's a clear liquid, and you add the alcohol, and this DNA appears by magic. And it's such an incredible moment, because you look at it and you think, oh my gosh, I've got the instructions to make a mosquito right there. and that blows my mind, you know, um, you know, and, and it never ceases to amaze me whether I've got human DNA, dog DNA, you know, it blew my mind on that day. And I, genuinely in the lab at that moment, I had a light bulb moment. I thought all living things have DNA. You think of your favorite animal somewhere in the world, in a laboratory, somebody we, we will be looking at DNA for that animal to conserve it, to stop it getting diseases, um, to look after it and protect it. So I could work on any animal I wanted. I could work anywhere in the world. There are DNA laboratories all over the world. Um, again, if I got bored of working on animals, I could work on humans. I could do forensic science. I could, um, you know, I, I could work on archaeology. There were so many jobs out there. A lot of jobs funnel you, um, you know, and you're, and you're very limited in what you can do, but working on DNA, I could see opened up a huge range of possibilities for me. Um, and, and it was really exciting. And, and like I say, it was very much at the start of things, you know, um, so it was an exciting time to be in genetics, to be learning about DNA, so, yeah. And it is incredible how much the technology has changed, as you were saying there, how quickly you can sequence DNA these days. Um, also, I've done a couple of videos. One of them was showing how you could make a model DNA sequence out of sweets using your yes, e yes. E and T, and also how to extract DNA from a strawberry. Um, yes. So I'll put links in the description for people to be able to check uh, them out as well, and that'll give Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh, 
Yeah, and, and actually, I, I did a blog for um, uh, Oxford University Press. So um, it's, it's a blog about extracting DNA from bananas. So I can send you that link to put on there if you like. It's a really nice one. And bananas tend to be cheaper. And um, there's not so many children that are allergic to strawberries. Quite a few I found as I go around the schools doing that are, are really like severely allergic to strawberries um, and kiwis are the same. So, uh, so yeah, i will happily send you those links. Yeah, yeah, send a link on. So if you go into the description, you'll find links to my DNA videos and also a link uh, there to that banana uh, article written by Mandy. <laughs> and we'll put in links for the little storytelling company um, as yeah, well. But we are not at the end yet because, as I said in the start, you are currently working on trying to set up a science centre in Norfolk. What can you tell us about this project? Well, a bit like in my book that I wanted to have a laboratory in my garden, and I've always dreamed about that because it would be amazing. So I've had this dream for a while now that I would love to have a science centre in Norfolk. Um, but, you know, but children all around the country can come to it. But unlike um, science museums um, that have are historical, so they're based on historical artefacts and things like that, this almost you can do in a new way. So this would be based purely on the science curriculum for KS1 and KS2. So all the exhibits would be focused on a topic within the curriculum and will provide something that teachers in the area couldn't provide for their kids. Um, and we, we're so lucky in Norfolk, we have so much science expertise. Um, we have this fantastic science park, we've got the hospital, we've got the university, uh, we've got the John Innes Centre, we've got this Norwich Research Park, we've got the Sanger Institute just along the road in Cambridge. Um, all these experts, but also experts in industry as well, you know, EDF, Anglia, um, Anglian Water, we've got um, forensics on site as well, so wouldn't it be great to have these exhibits in the museum that can actually teach something that you couldn't offer in the classroom and um, but also to have workshops alongside so in my head i'm envisaging three floors of exhibits there would be a laboratory attached for primary and secondary so we can run workshops relating to exhibits in the um, in the science center we'd also have a lecture theater with an imax theater a bit like they have in the science museum in london so we can have these fantastic videos like the david attenborough videos where the images pop out, you know, you have to wear your, your 3D glasses and a big outside area so we can do, you know, we can get the Norfolk Wildlife Trust involved as well um, and do a lot of um, projects on uh, classification. At the moment, we're working on a barcoding project, which is part of this huge project, this Darwin Tree of Life, um, where they're trying to get DNA from all the different species in the UK, which is part of a huge project to get DNA from all the species in the world. And primary schools are going to have a chance to, to be part of this. And um, so we're bringing that to a primary school level. So the workshops will be fantastic. They'd also offer work experience for a lot of secondary school kids. It's so difficult to get work experience in a lab. The people haven't got time. So we would run the projects for all the science centres. Um, and then we, um, the kids could have some kind of education at the same time. So if they're doing a DNA extraction, they can learn about what's happening, what are those chemicals doing, what's happening at the cellular level. Um, and these kids could actually then maybe produce scientific papers. What a fantastic start to their career. You know, there's so many opportunities here. And my dream is that every school in East Anglia can come and get a benefit from this science centre. Um, and I've just had an a, a email from the MP for our area this morning saying he's really excited about it and what can he do to help so i'm organizing a meeting to get everybody together and talk about how we can get this to move forward i mean what an amazing opportunity for kids in our area wouldn't it it's, be wonderful it sounds absolutely incredible i'm <laughs> kind of disappointed <laughs> it's not up here next to me um <laughs> but it, it does sound like an amazing project and that is a good time to bring in and um, probably what will be our final question here but you're talking there about the um, opportunities that you'll be able to give to children and young people in the area with that science centre. Have you got any advice for children and young people who are interested in STEM but aren't really sure about how to pursue it or where it can take them? Uh, well, I think um, I think you know to talk talk to your um, your teachers at school um, to see if there are museums where you can find out more about science to see. If there's any events going on, maybe with the um, so in our area, it's the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. There's lots of places where you can, you know, you can go and find out um, 
you know what all about the living things that live in our you know in our local area and um, libraries are a fantastic source of, of places and uh, mum's net and we, we have a, a mumbler page here so your mums and dads will have there'll be lots of activities going on in your local area where you can find out and listening to the news um, and also people like me so there's a uh, so I am a STEM ambassador um, and there's STEM ambassadors that will come into school and they'll do these hands-on projects um, working with you so I think um, that there's so many opportunities and if you if you don't know or you can't find any I'll be happy to, to point you in the right direction because I think all young people should have access to you know to finding out about science and, and getting hands-on with it so yeah just just drop me a line and how can people reach you? Are you on social media? Are you on Twitter or whatever that be able to find I, you there? I am. I, yep. So I have a Facebook page, uh, which is uh, the Little Story uh, Company. Uh, .co .uk. Um, there is my web page that's currently being upgraded, but we will be back up and running soon, which is the Little Storytelling Company. Uh, .co .uk. And my Twitter handle is uh, Little Story and then it's co, C-O. So uh, yeah, so you can find me Twitter, Facebook, uh, and on my Facebook page. And actually, if any teachers are listening, um, I, I do lots of Q and A's with schools. Um, anything I can do to help, my email is tlstc at outlook.com, which stands for the Little Storytelling Company. So do email me um, and I'm happy to help, particularly if you are reading the book, um, sometimes it's nice for the children they'll have lots of questions about the science um, and the book itself so I'm always always happy to speak to children and you know inspire them with this love of science it's it's really important. Mm -hmm.